Peace be to this house. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church and School. This is the seventh Sunday of Easter. We will also have uh, commencement exercises during the service. Um, that will, by the way, that will impact uh, the start of the service. We will begin with a processional hymn. Um, the crucifix will begin in the back of, of this part of the sanctuary and come uh, to the front here, and, and we will stand and face it as we sing the first hymn. Uh, just also uh, to call to your attention that June 3rd, which is a Saturday, um, is the Connect to Disciple workshop uh, that will be held here. Um, that's something you can sign up with Stacy in the office uh, for. It is a um, discipleship workshop. It's a kind of an evangelism workshop, um, how you might um, bear witness to the, the hope that is within you. Um, in particular, this is uh, meant to be a tool. I mean, this is a tool for every, every Christian. Uh, but in particular, um, it, it is meant to be a benefit for those who serve um, in various capacities within the congregation. So whether on a board or as a teacher in the school, you know, any, anything you could think of uh, in, in that regard, anyone who serves this church would, would certainly benefit from uh, going to something like that. Are there any other um, particular announcements uh, this morning to be made. Okay, well with that, uh, I invite you to rise and greet one another with the uh, peace of Christ. I invite you to turn to page 151 in your hymnal for Divine Service Setting 1. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We continue with the introit, which is found in your bulletin. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. Is he made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. you. 
let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth, whom you promised from the Father. For you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated for the readings. The first reading for the seventh Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 1. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day, day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Acheldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapters 4 and 5. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? 
Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful Creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, in this week's Holy Gospel, Jesus is heard praying to the Father. John chapter 17, actually the whole chapter is one long prayer of Jesus, which is often called the high priestly prayer. The place was Jerusalem. The time was Maundy Thursday, the eve of Jesus' death. And the hearers, besides God the Father, of course, were Jesus' assembled disciples. And of course, thanks to the book of John, which is in our Bible, the hearers are also us today. This morning we hear Jesus pray. It might have looked something like this. And in the prayer, Jesus speaks of the eternal life that the Father authorized Jesus to give to people. Eternal life purchased by the incarnation, life, ministry, suffering, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Now it's interesting, John chapter 17 verse 3 is a verse where Jesus actually defines eternal life. And this is eternal life, not as if he had to tell the Father what eternal life was in his prayer, of course, but Jesus was here in his prayer affirming what eternal life was, also for the benefit of his disciples who were listening, and for you. Eternal life, it turns out, is more than just living a really long time. Eternal life is about knowledge. Eternal life is about knowing. Not primarily knowing things or facts or information, but knowing a person. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now we often ask people, hey, do you know so-and-so? And they'll respond, yeah, yeah, I know him. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that the person is an individual recognized by us. We see them and we recognize them, hear their voice perhaps, and recognize them. Somehow we've made that person's acquaintance. But the knowing, this knowing that Jesus here speaks of is far deeper than that. This is the knowledge of intimate relationship. This is when we, human beings, recognize the loving heart of our Creator as a heart of love for us, this Creator who sent His Son to redeem us when we trust this God and entrust our lives to Him in devoted service. My daily Bible reading yesterday was from the book of Judges, book of Judges. It was chapter 2. And I was reminded that verse 10 of chapter 2 in Judges is very, very sad. Speaking of the days after the death of Joshua and his contemporaries, uh, jo Judges 2 verse 10 says this, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, means they died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. No, knowing. This was the kind of knowing that Jesus was talking about in our text. However, sadly, in the case of those people, it was a not knowing. They should have known Yahweh their God, trusted in him, and lived in cheerful obedience to his word. But they didn't. And since they did not know the Lord or his work, the Bible says the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, the gods of their pagan neighbors. You know, thinking about eternal life in terms of knowledge uh, puts in my mind Trinity's mission statement, which is know Christ, grow in Christ, make Christ known. Here at Trinity Church and School, we're about knowledge. Not just head knowledge, of course, but you could say heart knowledge. 
We want to know God's Son, Jesus Christ, our heaven-sent Savior, and we want to make Him known, this Savior. Now, eternal life, you could say, is the knowledge of our need for salvation and then the knowledge of that need having been met in the incarnation of God's Son and His life, death, and resurrection. See, no one receives eternal life or truly knows God who does not first recognize his or her need for salvation. Jesus, in his ministry, awakened people to their need for salvation. He did this by preaching and teaching, as he did all throughout the land of Israel. John 17, 6, in his prayer to his Father, Jesus recalls and attests, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world, for I have given them the words that you gave me. Jesus' ministry, besides his signs, his miracles, was a ministry of the word. He taught and he preached the word from God. And so he manifested or showed the name of the Father. Part of showing the Father's name was revealing the Father's holiness. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He's holy. He's perfect. Matthew 5, that quote, is where Jesus tells the people, you also. Now, is there any denying that? Of course our lives should be perfect. This perfect God has created us. Our lives should be no less than a reflection of His perfect holy life. As there was no place for the worship of Baal among God's people Israel of old, so there's no place among God's people today for the worship of money or the craving of created things or the pride and vanity in our appearance or in our accomplishments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, holiness also means our lives should be lived for others. Because your neighbor needs your love. Your spouse, your siblings, your classmates, even the stranger. Each needs your love. Have you given it? So in this way, through the revelation of God's holiness, His perfection, and the Creator's very understandable expectation that His creatures reflect His nature and His perfection, in this way, the teaching of Christ reveals our need for salvation. See, because we have, and any one of us here, attained to that which is required of us all. Jesus reveals the Father's name, not only revealing God's holiness, which leads us ultimately to sadness and despair that we can't attain it, but Jesus also reveals God's action, God's answer to our need. Simply put, God sent his Son, and Jesus is that Son. That was the other and really the chief and main part of Jesus revealing the Father's name to the people whom the Father gave him. The eternal word of the Father, as John says in chapter 1 of his gospel, became flesh, born of Mary, and bearing the name Jesus, not accidentally or by Mary or Joseph's choice, but by God's own appointment. Jesus, because that name means the Lord saves. So that people looking to Jesus might understand This is one who is here to save me. Your need and my need, this need for forgiveness and salvation, I tell you, it has been met. And Jesus himself has met it. He died to win it. He rose to prove it. And he sent his spirit and established his church to provide it through the means of grace, his word and sacraments. Yes, the knowledge of God the Father and of His Son, our Savior, this knowledge is given to us 
through the word. That's how it happens. Now they know, Jesus said, that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. At Trinity Lutheran School this year, the Word of God has been, it's been there. It's been taught, it's been preached, it's been provided and shared richly and frequently. There are some of the eighth graders, the um, graduates, who I would say have been drenched with that word. They've been soaked with that word because they are what you might call the, the long timers or the old timers here at Trinity, having been students 10 or even more years at this school. But even those who arrived here more recently have still been given that same powerful and true word of God, which is able to work faith in the hearts of those who hear God's word and to bring us the knowledge of God, that is, eternal life. It's not uncommon, I've heard this before, that graduates uh, from Trinity will say, after leaving, how they miss the way in which um, they were saturated with the Word of God on a daily basis. Well, guys, listen to me. Yeah, things change um, next week and when high school begins. You won't be with us anymore, and we'll miss you, and you may miss Trinity. But the Word of God is still being put forth and shared and preached and taught in this church, in your churches, so that there's no need for you to have um, uh, a dry spell without the Word of God. It's there. It's there for you, especially. And how important that is for us who live in this world, to have the Word from God given to us and spoken to us that we may receive it. Because this is a world where, as St. Peter in today's epistle said, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Jesus, in his prayer to his Father, spoke quite a bit about the world and about his disciples whom the Father gave him being in the world. Jesus asked the Father to help those disciples who were living in the world This world, loved by God, but yet evil and fallen. Holy Father, Jesus prayed, keep them in your name. So, the thing is that life in this world is of such a nature that unless the Father keeps us in his name, in his word and the revelation of his holiness and his grace in Jesus Christ, unless the Father keeps us in his name, Conditions and the nature of this world are such that we would not be able to hold on to eternal life for even a second. So much do we rely on Him. We need the Father's help. We need the Father's grace. We need the Father's power. We need the Father to keep us. And here's the encouragement today. Jesus prayed for that exact thing before we were even born. Long ago, in that prayer, Quoted in John 17, he prayed for those disciples who were there present, but he also later in the prayer prayed for all those who would believe in him through their word, like you. So in the face of temptations, you know what I mean? The the enticement to do what is contrary to God's commandments. In the face of distortions of God's truth, God's truth, and then the twisting of it. It's all about us. It's all around us in the world. In the face of insults and mockery, uh, the kinds of, the kinds of uh, treatment that Christians still receive today when they are faithful to their Lord, we need our Heavenly Father to keep us in His name. And He's well able to do that. He's able to do that. And you know He's able for you, through Jesus' teaching, Know the Father and his love for you. Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins, has taught you that God the Father and God the Son are agreed concerning their desire for your salvation. The Holy Spirit, through the words of Jesus preached to you, has given you faith to know God. That's why you know God. 
That's why you know him, the Holy Spirit, through the word, has worked faith in your heart so that you believers in the Lord Jesus have eternal life already now. Remember what eternal life is. It's not just living a long time, it's knowledge. And not just knowledge of facts, but knowledge of God and his son, Jesus Christ. So that amidst all the false gods of our world, gods like money and pride and power and pleasure, you know the one true God, the holy trinity of grace and salvation. And since we now know God, and since Jesus has prayed for us long ago and still prays for us, I want to tell you as you look at the picture of Jesus praying, this this is a signal to us that we, the people of God, the sons and daughters of God, ought also to pray as Jesus did to his Father and ours. We don't see, have to wonder whether God loves us or whether he'll be pleased with our prayers or bother to listen to them. The Father loves us in his Son. His pleasure in his Son is his pleasure in you who are baptized into his Son's death and resurrection. Most definitely, all of us young and old, men and women, boys and girls, can pray to our common Father, and he will hear us. We can, as Peter wrote in the epistle, cast all our anxieties on him because he cares for us. We can, as Jesus did, ask our Father to keep us in your name, and our Father will do that. Be our guard, our safekeeping. Keep us in the truth, in faith, in your word, in the revelation of Jesus. He will do that. I find that remarkable. His children call upon him, and he answers and grants us what we ask for. Amidst enemies, amidst temptations, amidst sin, sorrow, suffering, insults, even death. Keep praying. Guys, keep praying. For he whom God has chosen to be his Christian people, for we whom God has chosen to be his Christian people, belong to the Father and the Son. Jesus said, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Our text says that God the Father gave to Jesus all those whom he had chosen for eternal life, including you and me who have believed in Jesus through the word of the apostles. You and I belong to God. As I said a couple sermons ago, We are not lost or homeless. The children of God are at home where the word of God is spoken to us. We belong to him. This is true. And in our believing, in our faith in Christ, in our trust in the promises of God's word, in our lives lived in faith, the Son of God is glorified in us. And that's really remarkable. Glory is something we think of with respect to God. And in us, the Son of God is glorified. We who are by nature sinful and unclean, we bring glory to the Holy Son of God. How is this possible? Well, it's possible because Jesus Christ bore our sins on the cross. Where are your sins? They are taken away, the gospel tells us. John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus began his prayer, Father, The hour has come. What did he mean? The purpose of his incarnation. The next day was the cross. And the cross was not for Jesus' benefit, but for ours. The Son of God came down and became a man like you and me to be crucified. So that we who are sinful might be redeemed and forgiven. Redeemed and forgiven. Jesus knew why he was on earth, and he went to the cross consciously and intentionally to save you and me. And everyone who believes that has eternal life. To believe that indeed is to know God and his Son. Everyone who believes that brings glory to the Son. And everyone who believes that is one. One holy church. 
with Jesus as our head and God as our Father and His Spirit enlivening us and His Word ever instructing us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. My name is Nikki Annette, and I have attended Trinity for 10 years. I am glad that I attended Trinity because of the people. I have made many friends and met many people that I will never forget. Everyone here is one of a kind in one way or another, and I, have, I am so blessed to have grown up here. The teachers are also amazing. I have learned so much from them, and I am thankful for everything they have taught me, from math to band to religion. They have also taught me to persevere through the hard times and other important moral lessons that will stick with me for the rest of my life. They have taught me to be comfortable with things that make me uncomfortable. I am also glad that I attended Trinity because it was a blessing to grow up in a Christian community. I learned about God and grew closer to Him during my time at Trinity. I heard the Bible, prayed, prayed regularly of my class, and was taught the biblical truth about God and the world. Also. The instruction at Trinity pushed me to be my best academic self with challenging material that will help me through high school. Outside of class, I got to participate in soccer, basketball, and, ch and track. I cheered my team on at midwinter and other sport events. Trinity is like a community, a home away from home. It is more than a school to me. It is a place where I spent 10 years of my life. I am thankful for everything that Trinity has, and I hope Trinity continues to share God's word with all future students. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ian Earp, and this is Julian Hammerlink. We have attended Trinity Lutheran School for many years and are also both members of Trinity Lutheran Church. We have so many thank yous from over the years that it's hard to know where to start. But I think I would first like to acknowledge my classmates. <laughs> You've been nothing but supportive over the years. Thank you for all the memories we've made, and I look forward to the ones that we'll continue to make together. Next, I would like to sincerely thank Mr. Mueller, the teachers, and the supportive staff at Trinity. From the classroom to the cafeteria, from the basketball court to the track, and everywhere in between, the staff here has made a deep impact on all of us. Personally, the teachers helped me realize that I have people in my corner that are willing to support me. You didn't give up on me, and, I thankful for you, and I'm thankful for that. I'd also like to thank Pastor Growth, Pastor Dooley, and Mr. All three of you, plus previous pastors, Sunday school teachers, and VBS volunteers have positively impacted our spiritual growth. We thank you for the seeds you planted that the Holy Spirit would continue to grow in us. The congregation of the Trinity Lutheran Church also deserve to be thanks. Your prayers plus your financial and volunteer assistance have meant a lot over the years. Without your support, our school would not be able to do all that it does. I would also like to acknowledge all of the other congregationals and pastors represented in our student body. Thank you for our support, supporting us all of these years. Finally, we have two large thanks to give. First, we want to thank our parents. It was your decision to send us to Trinity. With that, that, without that choice, we can't imagine all that we would have missed out on. Thank you for the endless guidance for dealing with our occasional middle school attitudes, for all the homework help, for all the rides to and from school, and the ones to practices. The list goes on and on. I know I don't say it near enough, and I'm assuming my classmates don't either. 
but we love you and we appreciate you. Finally, and most importantly, we thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, without whom we wouldn't be saved for all of these things and so much more. Thank you. Good morning. While they're getting set up, just to introduce myself, my name is Kelly Fisher, and I had the privilege of being the eighth grade homeroom teacher to these students that are about ready to graduate. We had 24 of them this year, 13 boys and 11 girls, so it was a packed house in the eighth grade classroom, but they are a truly special class. Um, and I was reminded of that the last two days, well, Thursday and Friday on our class trip. They Students, you guys are going to do amazing things. God has big things planned for you. But I do want to remind you that as you go out to shine his light, you have to be plugged into the source. And I, Pastor's sermon was spot on, you guys. Continue to be in the word. Go to church. Pray. Build those daily habits to be plugged in so that you can shine God's love and light everywhere that you go. And please remember that everybody here, you're still our family. You're welcome back at any time. We're going to keep praying for you. Congregation, please keep praying for them, too, as they enter the next adventure of their life. We will be passing out diplomas this morning as well. So we have Mr. Mueller is here with our, us, our principal, and we have Pastor Doldy and Pastor Growth. Thank you, guys. So without further ado, let's get these kiddos graduated. Here we go. Our first graduate, Nikki Annette. Alicia Nicole Barrios Lopez. Karina Z. Borja. Camden Brucius. Logan Cole. Sebastian Schuyler Colson. Ian Earp. Jacob Frymark. Emma Jean Gatewood. Gage Hammon. <laughs> Julian Mitchell Hammerlink. <laughs> Leo Hawkins. <laughs> Cornelia Lynn Heck. Sophia Esther Jacobson. <laughs> Ava Judith Gloria Johnson. <laughs> Zachary David Jones. <laughs> Joseph Russell Kenyon. Emma Catherine Monty. <laughs> Noah McNary. <laughs> Abigail Lynn Rector. <laughs> Alexander Terrio. Alexis Taylor Van Kirkhove. Hunter Jonathan Vogel. Molly Meg Yeldon.
And if our eighth graders would please stand, you are now our graduates. Please join me in congratulating our graduating class. Thank you, graduates. You may be seated. God's blessings on your next adventure. We continue with the prayer of the church. I invite you to stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, ruler of all, protect and defend your church from every attack of the devil who prowls and seeks to devour. Where he tempts, strengthen your people to resist his seductions and terrors where he gains a foothold with false teaching or ungodly living, call to repentance and holiness. And where he incites enemies against your word and church, preserve your saints in the faith, that they may rejoice to share in the sufferings of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, bless the work of our missionaries. Bring forth your harvest from the seeds they sow. Support those who endure fiery trials for your name. As they shine the light of the gospel into hostile darkness, guard them with the sign of your cross. Let them rejoice that in tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, they share in your very sufferings. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you hold the might of man in your hand and can destroy all things by your mighty power. Bless our nation and all the peoples of the world. Where war and violence threaten, bring peace and justice. Where oppression reigns, bring liberty. Watch over those who defend us, especially the men and women of our armed forces and those who protect within our communities. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have saved us by your grace. We pray for the sick the distressed, those whose hearts are heavy, those whose lives are burdened, those who mourn and all who are in any need, especially the family of Maxine Williams, also Daryl Axtell, Ethel Baker, Steve Balster, Amanda Brown, Jeremy Brown, Carmody Catlin, Ashley Frymark, Dwayne Goodwin, Alice Hoffmeyer, Alice's sister Jan, Ross Huneman, Mackenzie Kelly's mother Duska, Carol Kiesling, Shirley Kimball, Margie Lefebvre, Douglas Leon Hart, Lola Reisner, Vera Rowley, Jerry Sanders, Carol Stellwagen, Michael Ty, and Angelia Wangert. Grant them healing according to your will, strength and mercy according to their needs, and the peace that passes understanding. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, your Son is both host and meal in the sacrament of the altar. Give us faith to recognize his body and to receive with grateful faith the blessed food that comes to us in Holy Communion. Guide us to live faithfully here on earth until we live forever with you. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, as the first Christians devoted themselves to prayer and worship following Christ's glorious ascension, Preserve us in the same until we are raised with all the saints to your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the offering.
we continue in prayer, I invite you to rise once more. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, from your hand we receive all good gifts, and by your grace we are guarded from all evil. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that acknowledging with our whole heart your boundless goodness, we may now and evermore thank and praise you for your loving kindness and tender mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.